Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today I wanted to share with you possibly the most important piece of knowledge or advice I have about how to get a better production, better mix, better mastering using the equipment you currently own. And this is not some clickbait mixing tip. I'm not just gonna tell you to mix in mono or use reference tracks, although those really do work. And I'm not telling you to go out and buy a load of acoustic treatment or buy loads of extra equipment that you don't currently have. The topic I'm going to discuss can often get really advanced, very technical, and quite frankly very boring. So I've spent a lot of time trying to find a good way to explain this without getting super technical in a way that everyone can understand. I want this to be a really sort of open and honest video and not just simply full of needless jargon and technical nonsense like that. So I do have a couple of tests and experiments that I'm going to show you later on, which I hope can be a little bit fun and maybe enlightening. But what this video is really about is it's all about how your room affects the sound you hear from your speakers and what you can do without buying a load of acoustic treatment to actually make your room sound better. And there's a few reasons I'm making this video. One is that I'm, I feel really bad seeing so many people going out and buying tons of acoustic treatment, just spending hundreds upon hundreds of pounds or thousands of pounds on just throw away acoustic foam and or panels that aren't really making a huge difference in their room. There are good ways to use acoustic treatment in a room, but a lot of people can't even use acoustic treatment anyway. They're renting a place or it's a bedroom. Uh, and I feel sorry for people that are spending hundreds of pounds on that. And the next reason I'm making the video is because me and others like me share loads of mixing tips and tricks online, but without understanding this core concept of how sound works in your room, all of these mixing tips and tricks just they don't really work in the way that they should and you you can apply them all and your mix can sound great in your room but then we all know it can just fall to pieces elsewhere when you listen and it's really it's not an enjoyable part of making music and, and what this video is about is trying to help you enjoy making music and, and not make it stressful so the core concept of this video is use the equipment you've currently got but use a calibration software to calibrate the output and create a perfect response for your room so that where you're listening is basically an ideal flat response from your studio monitors. Specifically the software I'm using to record, measure and correct my studio's sound is called Sonarworks, but there'll be more about that later. It's the software that I've been using for about eight or nine months to do this, really, really put it through its paces. However, let's start by just talking about professional studios. So the ideal place to create music, usually a multi-million pound facility, tens or hundreds of thousands of pounds have gone into the design, the layout, the acoustic treatment. And these spaces typically sound very balanced. And if you've ever had the privilege of being in one of these spaces, I've, I've been so lucky to get into a handful of these. All of the mixing tips and tricks you know, the reference tracks, mono, using certain you know compression techniques, EQ, everything just fits into place. The tracks seem to almost mix themselves because you hear every single frequency. You can hear everything in the mix. No matter which speakers you use in the room, everything just sounds balanced. Now there is a certain coloration to a room. Different rooms of course have different tonal balances but, but typically in some of the best rooms in the world they just sound balanced and if you can create a mix that sounds stunning in there when you can hear all the frequencies typically if you listen to it somewhere else in the car, in the club, in your own home studio it typically sounds really good. It translates well. That's the language that people use. It translates well to the real world so it sounds good in your studio good everywhere else. However, if I apply the same principle to a smaller room, like I'm in a small room here or even a medium sized room, maybe a bedroom, a spare room that you're using as your home studio, what tends to happen, and it's just a consequence of being in a small room, is that the sound leaving the speakers, it hits the wall, the ceiling, the corner, the floor, and all of these sound waves add up, multiply and subtract in different, not complementary ways. So at certain frequencies, you'll have big dips. So potentially at 82 hertz, you'll have a big dip, big 5, 10 dB dip in your room. And then at 125 hertz, you'll have a big 6 or 7 dB spike. And while using acoustic treatment to help prevent some echoey reflections is a fantastic idea. You know, if you can get more soft stuff in that room, if you can leave a bed, a bookcase, some acoustic treatment, that helps soak up all the sort of echo and reverb, which is great. It does almost nothing to deal with these big peaks and dips and spikes all the way across 
the spectrum and especially in the low end. These beautiful acoustic panels that I made myself uh, very inexpensively in my bass traps, they help deal with the reverb and the reflections so that I have quite a nice stereo image, but they do almost nothing to deal with the dips, peaks and troughs across the frequency spectrum in my room. I want to quickly say that I'm not trying to stress anyone out or say that you can't make music in your own room. Of course you can. But what I want to say is that if you can't hear your music properly the way it's supposed to come out of your speakers, at the end of the day, you, you can't mix what you can't hear. And that's just a basic principle. If, if you don't have a subwoofer, for instance, and you can't hear below 50 hertz, then you can't mix below 50 hertz. It really is as simple as that. And it's the same, you know, if you've got a big dip at 200 hertz and you can't hear it, then you're not going to be able to mix what isn't there, what you can't hear. And this is, in my opinion, the number one reason why the music that you mix in your studio, your bedroom, can sound good in your studio. It maybe doesn't sound quite as good as you want, but it can sound good and well-balanced in your studio. But then if you listen in the car, in a different studio or in a club or wherever, it just doesn't sound the way you meant it to sound. It's because if in your room you heard a big dip at 80 hertz, then you're naturally going to boost that frequency until you can hear it in the mix. And then when you listen to it in a different room that doesn't have that 80 hertz dip, there's gonna be loads and loads of 80 hertz in your mix and it's gonna sound really like muddy and awful. And this happens all over the frequency spectrum. They will be there whether you are using a $100 pair of speakers or a $5,000 pair of speakers. And if you don't deal with all of these peaks and dips and problems in the frequency spectrum, then it doesn't really matter how many, you know, how much parallel compression you do, how, much, how many times you listen to reference tracks or mix in mono. If you can't hear it, you're not going to be able to mix it. And that is the fundamental concept. But all hope is not lost. There's a really simple way to fix this problem. But instead of me just talking through this whole video, I've set up an experiment in my room to show what I'm trying to say. What I have done is set up a tone generator just playing about 30 notes across various octaves in the low end. It just plays the note, then a short gap, then the next note, and it just keeps increasing in pitch. And all of them are at exactly the same velocity. They should have the same amplitude. And when I record the signal inside my DAW, inside the software, so not out of my speakers, the result is that every single note is the same amplitude, the same energy, even though they increase in pitch. Now in an absolutely ideal studio, although it's never gonna be quite possible, this ideal response would be what you actually hear out of your speakers. So every single note, if it's supposed to be the same volume, you'll hear it as the same volume in the studio. But this is not at all what happens in almost any room in the world. So as a little proof of concept, I've set up the best microphone I have. This is the most sort of detailed one I've got, the LCT540, set it up exactly in my listening spot between the two speakers. And this is by no means a scientific test, but it is sort of a proof of concept. And you can see the result here as we go from lower frequencies up to around the low mids. Each note is at a completely different volume, some hugely different, some a lot smaller. This result is slightly exaggerated because the audio recorder uses a sort of logarithmic scale, so it looks further apart than it is, but you can still see there's dramatic differences and variation compared to the ideal response versus what happens in my room. And this is where that software and microphone sonar works comes in, which is what I was talking about just earlier. What it is is a reference microphone and software that pair together, the microphone's calibrated, and it walks you through, really simply walks you through measuring your studio monitor's responses in your listening spot. And then what it does is it creates a profile. It plays lots of test tones and, and runs measurements and creates a profile for what your room sounds like at your listening spot. And you can create multiple profiles, no matter how many pairs of studio monitors you have. If you move them, you can create another profile, of course. And what this does is it looks at how the frequency response reacts in your listening spot. So where are those peaks? Where are those dips in the spectrum? And then it applies incredibly precise filtering, EQs, various different sonic processors to even out this response, make it completely flat, really give you a very true and accurate stereo image and really extend the bass response and let you hear what's going on with it. And if I refer back to my test again, this was the response without sonar works, so none of this calibration was applied. These notes were all over the place. Immediately after conducting that test without moving anything, 
changing the volumes, I turned Sonarworks on and I ran the test again and this is the result. Although this is not a scientific test, you can clearly see compared to that sort of baseline of what my room sounded like, this is so much closer to the ideal response. And this is a test you can do at home. If you take a synthesizer that's like a set velocity or a tone generator and you just play from low octaves and just keep playing up, if any of the keys randomly sound really loud or really quiet, then you know where the problem area is in your room. And I have quite a few of these in the low end and the low mids of my room. But now when I turn Sonarworks on, all of these problems are leveled out. Then what I do is that I leave Sonarworks on. It applies this correction to the output of my system. So I leave it on whilst I'm mixing and I mix through it, okay? So I can hear this balanced response and I can actually apply all these tips, mixing in mono, using reference tracks, doing your parallel compression, your EQ. I can apply all these tips and tricks. The song feels like it's almost mixing itself because I feel like I'm in a good balanced room. And then before I export, you turn Sonarworks off because you don't want that correction being applied all the time. This correction is just to correct your room, not your mix. If I export the mix with the Sonarworks turned off now, and then I go take it to a different system, it just translates better. It's more likely to sound good in lots of different places. And this is what I've experienced when I've been doing mixes for clients, is that if I don't use the sonar works, they tend to just keep asking me, they're like, oh, the bass feels a little bit off. Could you raise the kick? Could you raise it again? Could you turn this down? And I can, you know, it seems to be quite a process backwards and forwards. However, when I use sonar works in the mixing process and then just turn it off to export, I then send that file to the client and they are much more likely to be happy with it. This is just my personal experience. And I know that many other well-known mixing engineers trust and use Sonarworks every single day. To try and conclude this video, the most important thing or biggest piece of knowledge, I guess, that I'm trying to pass on in this video is not just about the room correction, but it's really about understanding how your room sounds with the equipment you have, understanding that different speakers are gonna sound completely different in different rooms. Putting your speakers in a different place in your own room is gonna make a huge difference. And really taking a little bit of time to understand that your room isn't balanced at all, to be honest. Like there'll be all these issues all over the place in your room. Understanding this concept goes a really long way in letting you implement all the other tips and tricks and techniques you have and just understanding that in your mixing room, whether it's bedroom studio or a home studio, if you can't hear something, you can't mix it. And whether that means getting a sub so that you can hear more of the low end or ideally doing something like using correctional software so that you can really be mixing in a flat environment, it just allows you to actually hear what's coming out of your computer and speakers the way that you're supposed to hear it so that you can actually just enjoy the mixing process and not get so stressed out and not have to drag it out over days and days and many, many weeks. And I also see so many people chasing gear to try and improve their, their room. They're in a room, whether they've got acoustic treatment or not, and they're just upgrading thousands of pounds worth of speakers. AD converters, audio interfaces, buying super expensive cables, and this is all stuff that you're perfectly entitled to do. But some of these people are spending so much money on this stuff where they seem to be missing like a critical step, which is dealing with the sh uh, size and shape of their room. Very, very few of us can change the size and shape of our room, but you absolutely can change the sound that's coming out of your speakers so that it sounds balanced. So I hope this has been useful uh, to some people. I hope you enjoyed the testing. I know it's been a little bit longer than a usual video, but this really was uh, something important that I really wanted uh, to, to share with you. So anyway, I hope you have a really great week and I hope to see you in the next video too. Bye for now.